Welcome back to Better Things with Joe Bianca. I'm your host, Joe Bianca. This is episode seven. Later on, we're going to be handicapping two Breeders' Cup Challenge winning your in races at Kentucky Downs, one of the most unique opportunity-filled meets of the year. But first, we're going to talk to Seth Marrow, who's a public handicapper for Capital OTB. He also runs the racing news aggregation and handicapping site, Equidaily, one of the nicest, hardest working guys I know in racing. We had a great conversation, so let's talk to Seth. Welcome back to Better Things with Joe Bianca. I'm so excited to talk to this next guest. He's a host and public handicapper capper for Capital OTB, Seth Marrow. Thanks for joining me. Happy to be on, Joe. Uh, it was good to have you on our show uh, this summer up in Saratoga. That was fun. And so I like the the, the re-invite to, to appear with you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Reciprocity is key in this industry. And, you know, we, we, we know each other a little bit through our mutual friend, Steve Bick. We don't, we don't know each other all that well. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you here. Um, we'll start with this. You're a Saratoga guy. You grew up in Saratoga, correct? Well, a little bit south and west of here, Amsterdam, but half an hour away and spent a lot of time in Saratoga my whole time growing up. Now I'm in Boston Spa, which is about 10 minutes away for people. Who gotcha. Far. So let's, let's, let's start with this. How young were you when you first went to the track? Five years old, two years old, a fetus? How young? <laughs> my family was not composed of racing fans. So it was a kid in high school whose family was uh, racing related or, or fans, I guess. And we would sit in a study hall in the library in high school and kind of go through the paper and look at the entries and the next day, see what the results were and whatnot. So it wasn't until high school that I made my first uh, trip to the track. And I really kind of got involved over across the street at the harness track. Um, summers, I would be up there almost every night. Uh, and eventually, you know, so I, I made some ventures over to Thoroughbred Track, but it was probably more harness early on and then kind of shifted over and started to focus more on the Thoroughbred. Still make plenty of trips over the harness track, though. Interesting. Like, So what? how do you differentiate your strategies? Because I really have never been harness. I've like I've been to the Saratoga harness track, but it's usually simulcasting like after the Saratoga races are over. Like tell if I were going to go bet harness racing, what are just some basic pointers you would give me? Well, I, I think the the notable thing about harness racing in that the way I got into the game and I think is is maybe beneficial to other people, I think it's a nice way to get into the game and to get into betting because for the most part, at least at the half mile tracks, you're talking about a max field of eight and most races it will be eight. You know, it can go down to six or seven or up to nine or ten, but most of the time it's eight and they're virtually always at a mile. And so you're taking some of the puzzle out of the puzzle. Uh, and it, so it's it's a, a little bit easier to get in and handicap a little bit. And then once you've done that, you, you kind of start to make your, you know, your move up the ladder of what types of bets you make and what kind of results you want to look for. Um, then it's a, I think it's an easier transition over to the thoroughbred game. But that was probably what was notable to me as I started to make that transition. You added a few more pieces to the puzzle on the thoroughbred side. Well, that's what's, that's interesting that you say that because I never really thought about it that way. But, yeah, our races are very similar. Does that make it easier, do you, you think, from like a, a data perspective? Because that's it's so hard to make figures, I think, in thoroughbreds because there's different services, different distances. I don't even know anything about figures for harness racing. What, so what's, what's that like? Uh, that's a good question because I, I if there are figure makers, I don't – when I go over to the harness track – I don't think they're in the program. Um, now, there may be somebody who's doing them. I would imagine from a figure maker perspective, it would be much easier if they were doing That's a great. Maybe I'll start doing that. Maybe I can come up with that. <laughs> figures because it does seem like it would be an easier proposition because you're not one of the, you know, buyer for any of the figures. One of the things is, oh, we won't only ran one race at that distance today. So it was hard to come up with a figure later on. Uh, and, and with harness racing, that wouldn't be a problem. That's that's interesting. I, I, now, now I'm going to have to research that a little more because, as I say, I have never seen harness figures, but I, now I wonder if they're out there. I will add in, uh, I was also, for years and years, I, I loved the Greyhounds. My dad was retired down in Florida uh, in the Sarasota area. He was in Bradenton, but I would go to the Sarasota Kennel Club. And one of the things that I think the Greyhounds were great for teaching handicappers was the class level because that was their whole thing. You would get a couple of wins, at, uh, you would get a couple of losses at one class, you'd move down. And if you got a win, you moved up. And it became very obvious that 
you know, these horses are going from one class to the other, up or down, but it became very obvious it made a big difference. And, and that translated then for me over to the horse racing side, too, to be, become a little more aware of those class moves. Interesting. Yeah, you can reinvent yourself, Seth, as the Andy buyer of harness figures. If I can give you that idea, I'll take a small percentage and then we'll we'll move on from there. No, but it's great. You bring up Greyhounds, too. Another thing I really don't know that much about. Um, the one thing that I that I felt like would be frustrating about harness racing and greyhound racing is like when the horses break stride in harness racing or if like a dog bolts or whatever. Did you ever find that that, you know, that there were there was that kind of variable that you don't really get in thoroughbred racing? Yeah, early on, I mean, and still, but I mean, early on when you're getting into the game and, and they go from the gate and, you know, you've got a horse in a double or whatever and three strides out, he breaks stride and, you know, they're off, you lose. That is one of the, the real drawback, drawbacks of harness racing. There's no question about it. Uh, greyhounds, you would get the, the occasional dog who would kind of fall over in the turn and maybe come back running the wrong way. That, that doesn't happen quite as much in greyhounds is the horse breaking stride in, in harness racing but yeah that is one of the frustrating aspects but that, you know there's the similar things in in the thoroughbreds too i've always said i wish they had rules that horses had to maybe get out that first 50 yards on the thoroughbred side before they're official because you know you you get those they're off you lose kind of situations where they do Call your horse, you know, no contest or declare a non-starter if the starter has a hold or those kind of situations. But there are plenty of situations where a horse just gets off to a bad start and subsequently has no chance. And I would love to see him kind of figure out so everybody has kind of a fair shot. Because particularly at a place like Saratoga where you get new people, that's just frustrating. And that's not a great way to introduce fans that, oh, gee, you know, I made yeah. a bet and three strides out of the gate, I was done. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm curious to know about your, your uh, impression of Saratoga over the years, because you haven't been going there as long as I assumed you'd be going there, but you have been going there for a while. It's get, it seems to get more and more popular every single year. You know, the track has changed a little bit. What, what are some of the things that you've seen over the years that maybe you like better than it used to be or maybe that has, has not has not been the same that you as you remember it? Well, I I go back to the days of no fence in the paddock, which is kind of crazy. That was just I overlapped that barely. Um, but we think about that now and it's mind boggling. But there were no fences. They would saddle the horses. Uh, there would be a tree with a number on it and they would saddle the horse there and the crowd was right there. Um, and as they say, incredible to think about. But that was there. And so it was one of those situations that I think is very Saratoga-esque and st remains so to this day where – Oh, the change came, and then, well, this is horrible, and how quaint it was by the trees, and now it's a fence. And uh, but it was made for the right reasons, and now we're all used to it. And the paddock, as it is right now, is very nice, and people can still line the fence on the paddock or get a picnic table by the paddock, and it's it's a great spot. Um, I remember when the clubhouse was really more of a clubhouse. It was now the clubhouse goes down a few sections of the, uh, you know, the fold down seats. That was not the case. The clubhouse when I started was the box seats only. So it was a much smaller clubhouse, but again, that was a nice move. And uh, in recent years, they have added that top of the stretch uh, section, which is a little bit of an upgrade. If people aren't familiar that the grandstand sections up near the top of the stretch, uh, if it wasn't a big day, they would essentially be empty. And so it was a great move by Naira to make that a little bit of an upgrade. And I know I've talked to owners and people who have boxes there now and, and really enjoy it. And it's a, that was an improvement that, again, I think when it first came, people were kind of like, eh, I don't know, but I think that's worked out very well. The 1863 club, is, uh, you know, when that first went up, people complained, but it used to be a tent sitting there. So uh, that I think that's a very nice upgrade. People seem to enjoy that. I was in that a few times uh, this year having lunch and everybody has a great time and you get a great look. They've added that tailgate area on the clubhouse turn now for a couple of years. That really seems to have become popular. And I think that's a great idea. People can pull, pull a car up, literally tailgate and uh, watch the races. There are some betting windows over there and you have a kind of a unique look and you're right there on the fence. I think that's probably great for developing new fans. And then this year they added that uh, paddock bar, the two store. And again, people love it. I know. People, 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 oh, consternation. And now they've, they've nicknamed it the Treehouse. I'm sure a lot of your viewers and listeners have seen the pictures on social media. And the name is, is very apt, uh, you know, apt because uh, 
it's kind of sitting there amongst the trees. And I, again, I was in the upstairs of that doing a handicapping seminar in the middle of the season. Great venue. You got a great look at the paddock and the horses walking out to the track. So I think that was a, a nice addition too. So just the, there have been many changes to Saratoga over the years that all because of how historic it is, understandably, people, there's a little consternation at first, but I think they've made the right moves and have kept the historic nature of the facility overall. I mean, you walk around, I will tell people that haven't been there, even people that have been there, because it's hard sometimes to notice, but walk around and take a look at the ironwork that's just around up on the, there are horse heads and it's all ornate and from a, kind of a bygone era, but that all remains if you look for it. It's easy to walk by, but the historic nature is still there, which is very good. And most importantly about Saratoga over the years, yeah, when I first started going, I got to the, I probably went over there just at the beginning of when it was starting to resurge. You know, I, I as I say, my parents were not horse racing fans, but like a lot of people in this area, they would go to the track once or twice during the season. And they talk about the days where you didn't pay for a grandstand seat. You got there early, you put a newspaper on it. That was your seat for the day. And there weren't that many people to object to that. Yeah. As you know, we got into the 70s and 80s. And when I started going, Mary Lou Whitney and a group built SPAC. That became very popular. The highway system changed a little bit. And as I say, it was kind of at the beginning of the resurgence. But. It has been fun to watch that build over the years. And it's just, it's a great venue, mostly, I think, to develop new fans because people come there and they come for the social aspect, the picnic in the backyard. You see the horses walking by on the horse, horse path. You're out by the paddock. They have the little band playing in the back every day. And that's a lot of fun. And uh, all the local media covers Saratoga because it is our professional sports here in the upstate New York area. And so I think it's a great way to get people engaged in the game. And they do a great job of that. Yeah, I mean, as long as you can get get someone there, they'll always want to come back, I think, is the thing. And the, the horse path, you brought that up. That's so huge because I know I've been to a lot of tracks, maybe not as many as you. But I like I, – you feel like you can reach out and touch the horse. Now, don't do it because they'll, they'll, they'll throw you out. But like even if you lean over a little bit, they <laughs> just, uh, but 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 even so, like just the fact that they're that close, it really makes you feel part of the action more than any other racetrack. And that's what I tell people. Like I have friends who ask me, "Oh, can you take me out to Belmont? Take me out to Aqueduct?" I'm like, "Yeah, I will, but come to Saratoga. Like take a weekend with me. Come Absolutely. to Saratoga in the summer. Then you'll really get the essence of what racing is about." But <laughs> the other side of that is the human side with the trainers and the jockeys. I mean, it's it's fun during the day to watch the jockeys walk back to the jocks room and the little kids run up and yeah. jocks with the goggles or sign an autograph. The other day, uh, John Velasquez gets his thousand Saratoga victory. And I followed him out with a camera. People can find it on YouTube, my Equidaily YouTube channel. Um, I followed him out and people were lining the, the jocks path, applauding, uh, posing for selfies, getting autographs. And then our friend Steve Bick uh, tweeted the other day that it was the 10th anniversary of Ramon Dominguez getting his six win day up there. I had on that day 10 years ago done a similar thing following Ramon back to the jocks room with the, the folks clapping. And it was funny kind of looking at those two side by side and seeing the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. The Saratoga fans are sh so appreciative on our big day like that for a jockey all the way back to the jocks room applause and pictures and autographs. And again, that's what makes Saratoga so special. Yeah, The accessibility of the people and the horses, you really cannot beat that. It's like, like you say, it's kind of like going back in time to a place where racing is still king. Yeah. And there are very few places like that left in the world, much less America. So that's, that's, I think what makes it so special too. You mentioned Equidaily. I think that's one of the things you're known for as well, not just being a public handicapper. You know, it's a news aggregation plus handicapping site that's been pretty popular. Um, are you still keeping up with that? Or are you doing more of the video stuff? Like what's, what's your involvement with Equidaily today? Equidaily has taken a little bit of a break, but it's coming back. Um, it's just, uh, it was one of really the first news aggregation sites became very popular. Um, but the internet changed a little bit. And so, uh, um, I've stepped back for a couple of months just with a game plan to, to get it back. And I was going to, I was just going to really transition right into it. I thought, let me step back a little bit and kind of reintroduce it new. It's not, I have said to people, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. What will happen? Hopefully we're, and the game plan is be back up uh, by Breeders' Cup time with uh, just some tweaks and some changes that'll kind of recognize that things have changed a little bit and we'll, have some different focuses maybe, but the overall theme will still be the same to kind of compile um, news and, and make it easy for people to find horse racing content 
in one spot as a, and that's what, how it started years and years ago. Um, I, you know, the internet was fairly new and I was kind of realizing, boy, there's a lot of great horse racing content on here, but it's hard to find. And I yeah. thought, no, the light bulb went on it. Thought, let's put it all in one place. And that's what we did. And then again, it became very popular. But as the internet changed and social media is out there now, I've just thought, well, let me tweak it up a little bit. So we'll be back, though. No doubt. That may I mean that makes sense, too. And it's good for us, too, at the TDN also, because, um, you know, we, we like to check on our competition. If like there are news stories that are breaking that we're not on, I think Equidaily was a good resource for that because then we could get everything in one and then figure out like what we need to catch on up yeah. on and stuff. But Let's talk about your public handicapping background, because, you know, I, I think of you as a capital OTB handicapper. You do a great job there, obviously. Uh, where did you cut your teeth, though, first in that realm? Was there, were there people who were big influences with influences on you? Were there people that first looked out for you that got you in, into that world? I, uh, I probably as I was a kid and then, as I say, started to transition over to the, the thoroughbred game a little bit from the harness side. I was looking at Russ Harris and the, the Daily News. I mean, the two, you know, the two New York tabloids, uh, you go back and they had a number of handicaps. I mean, boy, you look at mainstream media in the house. It's so sad. It's compared to really fairly recently. But when I first got in the game, there were multiple, you know, there's been a little consternation on social media over the past couple of weeks with the uh, the public handicapper scorecard. And there's been a debate about picking winners versus ROI. I think they're both legitimate. But I look at the the list, and and I used to compile at the end of the season on Equidale, the all the public handicappers, and there were probably thirty of them bouncing around. The two New York tabloids, all the local papers had multiple uh, public handicappers, and that's kind of you know squeezed down a little bit. Particularly if you're outside of Saratoga, some of the local newspapers that have Saratoga handicappers won't, won't have anything the rest of the year. Obviously, they've cut back on the two New York tabloids. But again, I, I used to pay attention to. Uh, uh, Russ Harris, I like your colleague. Always enjoyed Bill Finley. I, I I have mentioned to him a couple of times over the years. I can remember years and years ago he had a great column where he I I want to say he started in Saratoga, but he made three tracks in one day. It was I think it was Saratoga, Rockingham, and maybe Suffolk. So like the first race at Saratoga, then the middle of the card at the Rock, and then went on to Suffolk if I'm not mistaken. But that was a fun column. So I would read Bill Finley and, and all the guys in those. Uh, tabloids, but Russ Harris was the guy because he did the uh, the kind of public handicapping that now I do. As I say, Equidilly's taking a little break from the aggregation, but during the Saratoga season, I still posted my picks, and I tried to do that Russ Harris kind of thing, and, and other handicappers do, where I put my top three picks up and, and write a couple lines about it, and that was enough from a guy like Russ Harris to get an idea of, oh, okay, here's here's where you want to focus, or here's something important to, to pick up on this horse, and and that's kind of I would say he was an influence, certainly, on the direction I went. Right. So what was like your first break in terms of doing getting, getting a public handicapper role? Well, again, it goes back to not Equidaly, but I used to, uh, my background, I had, a, I graduated from uh, Syracuse with a, I spent a couple of years at RPI studying engineering, wound up at Syracuse in film school. So I graduated with a, with a film degree from, from the Newhouse School wow. at Syracuse. And subsequently, I opened up a television production company here in Saratoga. And we would do, uh, we, we had some sponsored programming. We Homes for sale on Sunday mornings. We did restaurant reviews, a Sunday morning restaurant review show. Um, but I also, for a few years, the local PBS channel, WMHT, I would do two specials uh, every year on Saratoga for about four or five years. Just a kind of a magazine type of show with, you know, a little, four or five minute features on people or places or whatnot. Um, so we did that for a few years. The Chris, the old Chris Lincoln show on ESPN. We did some Saratoga footage for him every year for a few years. Um, so I had the television production company in town. And when the internet kind of became the internet, put up a website for uh, the television production company. And being a horse racing fan, I started a page that is still essentially now the Equidate Daily Handicapping page. I started one on the television production company website that made picks every day for Saratoga. Um, and so that got very popular. And, and just the, the picks, you know, you would have the normal number of people who are interested in television production company. But every August, the picks would become pretty popular. 
Then I transitioned right. over to Equidaily. I kept that going. And, and that was kind of helpful to Equidaily because I already had a base of people who were. So I started Equidaily, whatever number of years ago it was, I started it on the first day of Saratoga. So I knew I would have all the people who would fo- were following the picks automatically come to this new website. So it worked out well. Equidaily then subsequently became what, and and I'll go back to the beginning of Equidaily. It was kind of interesting because in the first year, a couple of years, there was there were a few big stories, uh, including the the Pick Six brouhaha, which was a huge story that didn't just have breaking news; it would have breaking news every couple of hours for the first few days. So that helped Equidaily as well. There were there were a couple of there was the the also the crazy story about the buzzer uh, with Jose Santos uh, on the the derby horse and which turned out obviously to not be true but people were looking at pictures and whatnot that story had a little bit of juice and so again there was a a couple of nice news stories right at the beginning that really helped the thing take off so that took off got some press and uh, subsequently John Preachy who uh, racing writer and still out there on the internet writing Mm -hmm. at the time was uh, working with OTB TV. I, uh, Nick Kling and Tom Amello, who had a Sunday morning show on OTB TV, when Equidaily became popular, they invited me to the studio uh, one morning to talk about the website. They came in and talked about it. And John Preachy then came in uh, after the show was over and said, hey, how'd you like to come and do some handicapping for us? And, and the rest is history, as they say. Awesome. That's great. I mean, well, that leads me into, because I would love to talk about Capital OTB, especially vis-a-vis New York City OTB, because that's how I cut my teeth in handicapping, was going to the New York City OTBs. I would sneak in because I was under 18. Um, and it was just, you know, it was a terrible proposition because they would charge you the surcharge on the winning wagers, which was just just so ridiculous in, in hindsight. Even at the time, it seemed pretty ridiculous. But it was the only place outside the track in New York City to really gather and watch some races. And it's a shame that it went under the way it did, you know, with all the, the corruption in New York. But Capital OTB has had staying power. And it's a real and it's a big deal up north in the Capital region. And, you know, even now, the old New York City OTB channel just it streams the Capital OTB feed. Um, so I still see you on there. But so where do you think that Capital OTB has uh, has succeeded, you know, where New York City OTB failed? I think the television station is a big part of it, um, and, and credit to the the folks who you know were o, the heading OTB years ago to have the foresight to to get this uh, you know partnership in the summertime with Naira. And thanks to the folks at Naira for allowing us on the backstretch. And, and for your listeners who aren't familiar, we broadcast from the Saratoga backstretch every morning for going back Saratoga seasons for long before I was part of it. Um, and we're out by Clare Court and the horses work out behind us. And it's it's fabulous because it's a great location. People love Saratoga, as I say, it's our major league sport. So people are tuned in. Um, and I, I always say to people, the biggest names in horse racing are a golf cart right away. So yes. I do the, the nine o'clock handicapping show. And for a few years now, I've done the 10 o'clock interview show every racing day in the morning from the Saratoga backstretch. And, you know, over the years we've talked to, I've had Alan Jerkins over there and Jonathan Shepard. And a couple of weeks ago, Todd Pletcher made a visit. and He's been there a number of times. And, you know, Johnny Velasquez and Javier Castellano and a number of owners, the West Point folks and, and, uh, had Sal Cuman a little earlier, and you, just anybody you name in industry types. You had Tom Rooney from the NTRA a few weeks back. We had Lisa Lazarus, uh, who you talked to as well recently. Just interesting to get her perspective on the beginning uh, few weeks of Heisa. And, and so it's industry people. It's uh, you know the jockeys, it's the trainers, it's the owners, and they're all sitting there live next to me. And the nice part about it is, and I've complimented you guys on what you do with the writers' room on TDN, and you're kind of in the same vein. You get somebody there and you can talk for 15 or 20 minutes and it's not just tell us about your, your big horse and the stakes this weekend. We can get a little into, you know, what's your background and, and give a little humanity to it that I think then pulls fans in a little more of, hey, I kind of know this guy and I'm, I kind of root for this guy. Or guy Jackie Davis on the other day got a lot of great feedback to that. And I think that helps pull fans into the game as well. But beyond Saratoga, we're showing Capital OTB TV shows, multiple tracks each day. I do the interview shows uh, still on the weekends, and I come in and handicap 
in the afternoon. I think it's just, you know, it, it appeals to horse players when you can go to your TV and turn it on and, and kind of sit back on your couch, particularly now that you can bet on your computer or your phone. And uh, I think that is a big part of what has kept the popularity of Capital TV. Well, and I miss it. Like, on, on, I used to watch on dark days, I mean, Mondays or Tuesdays on the New York City OTB channel. They would have like Howie Tesher and Anthony Stabile when he was younger. You might have been on there a couple times, too. And it was just great to have that that feed of racing, you know, especially on the, on the slower days where you just you, you needed that racing content. You wanted to consume it. And now it's just we don't have that in the city anymore, which is, you know, it's a real shame. Um, but I but I commend you guys and everybody at, at Capital OTB for what you do. Well, let's, let's talk nuts and bolts, Andy. I'll tell yeah, you that in the past probably, well, more than a year now, uh, a year ago this past January, we went on one of the Roberts channels, RTN, where Capital OTB is now sub-channel. And I got a lot of feedback okay. the last two seasons up at Saratoga from people who – uh, watch on Roku or the Fire Stick, watch the RTN feed. Our morning programming, there's also a Capital OTV YouTube channel that people can follow on. We usually, uh, all of Saratoga programming is tweeted out in the morning. It's on our Capital OTV Facebook page, which is nice because it, it used to be cable system systems in upstate New York would carry us, which was a pretty big audience. But now we're virtually everywhere. And, and I hear from a lot of people, as I say, the last couple of, of years who walk up to me at the track because obviously the track is our core audience. So during the, the Saratoga meet, I got to get a lot of great feedback, which I totally appreciate. But lately, you know, past couple of years, people walk up and say, man, I really love the program. You guys do a great job. I appreciate the, the live folks uh, from the backstretch. And I, when I'm not up here, I'm watching from home in Long Island or in Kentucky or in Florida, which is great as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's so key to have that kind of reach nowadays because you guys really do deserve that big of an audience. Let's talk about your your handicapping style. How do, you know, how do you how do you attack a day in general? Do you do you go by by whatever the races are or do you try generally to start with multi-race bets and then maybe pare down? How do you what's the first couple of things you do when you open the forum for a day at Saratoga, say? Well, being a public handicapper, I have to hand handicap every race every day, and I'm a couple of days ahead. So then one of the factors, of course, which this year, you know, knock wood, and thankfully wasn't much of a factor, but one of the factors is the weather. That's going to maybe change up, you know, how you, you come into it, given, as I say, you've handicapped a couple of days ahead. I'm As a player, I'm more of an exacted guy, and in, in the last few years, I've gotten into picks, uh, pick fours uh, uh, especially, uh, I like. And so then you, you get into the day and you're kind of looking like everybody else. I mean, I said earlier, the, uh, you know, there was a little debate on, on Twitter about picking winners versus the ROI for public handicappers. I aim to get 120 during the year. Um, that's three a day. If I do that, I think I'm giving out good information, but I have no argument with people who are more focused on ROI. I think, as I say, both are, are very relevant and important. But the way I handicap as a public handicapper, I try to give them, I think it's more consistent. I try to pick, here's who I think is going to win. Here's who I think will finish second, third, fourth. And then in the commentary, you know, at Saratoga, we have a handicapping show every morning. So you can hear me there uh, when the rest of the year I'm in the studio live. And that's nice also, because then I can look at the odds and comment. But I try to, you yes. know, if the, my top pick is sitting there at six to five. And the next pick is at eight to one. And I'm saying in the morning on the morning show, you know, I, I, I'm going with the six to five shop, but very tepidly, I think these two are pretty close. And you get those odds in the afternoon. I'm going with the eight to one shot. I'm using that one certainly sure. somehow. And hopefully people are sure. um, as well. So, again, I'm, I'm kind of looking at staying consistent and going. Here's what I think first. Here's what I think second. Because as a public handicapper these days. There are so many betting opportunity options out there. You know, it's not just it's not 50 years ago with win play show and three exactas and one triple a day. There are the pick bets. There's everything. So somebody who is negative, including me, on a three to five shot for a win bet, that may be their single and a pick five because they have a couple 20 to one shots later on that they want to include that they think are very good. So I try to stay consistent with, as I say, what I think is going to happen top, you know, first, second third, fourth, but I try to comment in a way that, that either separates them appropriately or closes the gap so that in the afternoon people can kind of look at the odds and, 
and make their own decisions. And that's what it's about. You're going to make your own decision anyway, because as I say, you have different types of bets, which require different types of strategies. But for me, as I as I say, I'm looking at the exactas, I'm looking at the picks, and I'm looking during the day to find some interesting prices in my mix that will allow me to then make the decisions exactas or, or and or uh, pick bets um, because that's where the value is. Obviously, if you can start to see some six, seven, eight to one shots and up, then you can you can concentrate on those races a little bit and hopefully make some money. Well, that's why that's why I think it's so it's so key to have those kind of all day streaming, you know, options for the better, for the better at home, because it's one thing to read it in the paper on a website and say this so and so likes this horse for tomorrow. But then when you're watching it in real time and the person can tell you, like you said, well, I like this horse, but not at this price. That to me can give, make people give people more informed decision making than just putting it in the paper a couple of days out. And this is like my that's kind of my dilemma because. I'm doing a this is like my first foray into public handicap because this show is so you have like a little Breeders' Cup sponsorship where I pick a bunch of the uh, the Breeders' Cup winning year in races, but I pick them on Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah. And I'm not going to pick a horse that's I know is going to be four to five, even if I think the horse is tough to beat. You know, I'm trying to make people money. And if if there is a four to five shot that I, you know, I, I can't get past, let's try to play a pick five or a pick four or something. So there is that pressure, I think, to really try to v maximize value as much as you can. And it's harder to do days out for sure. But let's talk, you know, let's talk a little bit about sports. Are you a sports guy? Do you ever do sports betting? Is that any, any, any part of your handle? I haven't really gotten into sports betting uh, yet anyway. But uh, I, and as far as sports, you, you know, I. I Played football in high school, and um, I still play some old man basketball at the Y. And so, you know, I pay attention to a little bit to college football and the NFL. That said, I'm a Jets fan, so I'm usually out by about week three. Oh and, and I'm a Syracuse graduate. Yeah. So, that, although they look good against Louisville the other day, and I guess they're getting a little juice. They got some votes, votes I get in one, one of the polls. So, maybe some Syracuse uh, this year. But I'm a huge college basketball guy. I love Syracuse. And, uh, you know, I'm, I lament to this day the uh, demise of the old Big East, which I think was college basketball oh, at its best. But Absolutely. I still follow up Syracuse quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually, I, I went to the last Big East championship game at the Garden before the Big East split up because that was, that was heaven. I mean, that was basketball yeah. heaven. Those day, those tournaments at the Garden, yeah. it was just, it was electric, and it, I, it was nothing like it. So with the last championship game, I was like, I don't care how much the tickets are, I got to be in the building for this finale of the Big East. Let's let's commiserate about the Jets real quick, and I will promise the audience we won't go long. But it's just only because this happened today that I have to bring this up. The thing with Zach Wilson, where yet literally Monday, the coach says. He might be back because he, he tore his meniscus in the preseason. Literally, the coach says on Monday, he might be able to play this week. And then today says the earliest he'll be back is week four. Tell me another franchise, Seth, that has this kind of bumbling incompetence on off days, on a Wednesday. Like it just it never ends. Seth. I'm sure you I'm sure you can commiserate with that. It's just what's amazing to me is they're in New York City. The, the you know, the the. Biggest market, and uh, and how do they not get some kind of a team at some point that can go and and virtually every year I'll you know on the one of the Saratoga shows NBC's in town and I'll have Randy Moss and Jerry Bailey over and Randy Moss of course now also covers the NFL network and he knows and <laughs> we go to a commercial and he turns to me he says how about those Jets every year and, and I, he doesn't say anything to me say, can't say anything back you <laughs> know. He does the exact same thing to me, but yeah, just like just like the 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 mundane incompetence. Like we're not even talking game day. We're talking just getting through the injury report. They can't manage to do it without looking stupid. <laughs> it's brutal. It's brutal. I, I go back to the, when I was a kid. As I say, I was a, I was a quarterback when I was in little league and in high school. So I was oh, a cool. Joe Namath fan, and so at least I got that memory working for me. But I was I was pretty small when that happened. So it's a right. very distant memory. Well, it's the word. Like I'll tell you one last chance thing. This this should include me in here. The first year I rooted for them was 1999, which was the year after they made it to the AFC Championship and lost to the Broncos. Literally, the first quarter of the first game I rooted for the Jets, Vinny Testaverde tore his Achilles on that old concrete at the Meadowlands, and I should have taken that as a sign and been like, eh, maybe you should pick a different team. <laughs> here I, I am, 27 years later. Pick a different team. But you know when that happens, when either of us, 
then that's the year that we, we put them in the winner's circle. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like when you're against the horse and then, yeah, I know. I, I know. I, I, I try not to get too broken up about it, but it's, it's just hard, man. It's, it is. It, you got it. Really it is. On you. Yeah. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's talk about this. I, I'm curious because I, I think most handicappers would have like a score or a, a horse really that really grabbed them and, and brought them into the sport. Do you have like a memorable score or a memorable horse that really kind of solidified your love for racing? Forgo was was mine. Forgo, okay. when I first got into the game, he was there and he was a horse that could carry weight. I mean, there was that crazy when he gave 30 pounds away and and caught what well, honest pleasure uh, in the honest pleasure fools, but in the stretch um, and just insane. Um, and then I saw him up at Saratoga in the slop and my in person race. Uh, he didn't run well at all, which was a little bit disappointing. But he is very much uh, the horse that pulled me into the game. One of my most memorable in person uh races and a, a, a horse that you know had a memorable race at saratoga general assembly when he set the track record in the travers that day i liked smart who was a woody stevens horse who had kind of bounced around and done pretty well and come some of those second string dirt like at the hot the ohio derby maybe and i and so that day i was all over smart and Smartin runs great and is well clear of the third place horse, but well behind General Assembly. But that was a great performance. And, of course, the track record of that held up for years and years. So that was my best in-person performance. True handicapper. He remembers even the horses he liked that ran second. <laughs> That's when you feel like you were right. It sticks because I thought, man, any other day he wins by 10. But with General exactly. Assembly in there, no, doesn't happen. I know. If so-and-so wasn't in the race. You know, I just I let's just ask real quick your impressions on Flightline because you know when you bring up Forgo, you know there's there's a horses that I've heard about and I you know I know through through history, but I've never seen in person. You haven't seen Flightline in person yet, I'm assuming, but just watching him on TV, is there anybody that you can compare him to? I thought that race the other day was incredible, and then the buyer figure comes out, and you're just wow, that's this is insane. And, you know, for anybody who's kind of arguing, but he's only had so many starts and, you know, will will some point there be some adversity to that that he has to overcome? I, those are legitimate questions. I mean, here in the 21st century, for better or worse, we do have horses with limited schedules. I would like to see horses that that came out in, in the I'm not going to see this again, but came out in the, the days when I first got into the game. I mean, the Wood Memorial used to be a couple of weeks before the, the Derby. That doesn't happen anymore. And so it's a different type of schedule now and whatnot. This guy's even a little more limited. But I did have Terry Finley on a few weeks ago, and he said uh, on my morning show, and it was I think it was reiterated by the Flightline folks this week, that they're hoping to get him back next year. So yeah. that's great for the game. So we'll see what he does in the Breeders' Cup, but I think there's no denying what we've seen so far with the exclamation point on the other day. Uh, he's he's something special that, again, folks like you who maybe didn't get to see a Forgo or whatnot, this is your horse to kind of be able to say 20 years down the line. I was there when. Uh, yes. because it, it's special. I know. And actually, we had Costa Hironis on the writer's room today, and he said the same thing. He said, quote, there's a great possibility he'll be back as a five-year-old now. You know, I've heard that before, and, you know, the yeah. horses are whisked off the stud. But it does seem like there is at least some intention to bring him back. So so we'll cross our fingers for that. All right, last question for me. He, and we talked about your public handicapping skills and your role there. But you you were also a journalist. You also covered racing as a journalist. One of the things that I kind of causes me a little bit of consternation about racing journalism, it's like a little bit too deferential sometimes. And you guys don't do this. You know, you and Steve are pretty good about telling it like it is. And, you know, at the writer's room, we pride ourselves on that as well. But I just think of like all the years that people reported on Jason Service and Jorge Navarro, like with a straight face. And it's just not enough scrutiny for me to where when something, a huge controversy happens, like the FBI indictments, I think all of racing media kind of had egg on its face after that. What do you what do you feel about that? Do you think that racing journalism needs to be a little bit more adversarial or, do you, you know, how do you feel? Yeah, I have mixed feelings on that because it's, it's to me, it's maybe more the place of mainstream media to, to, because these days I think and maybe justifiably so, because. They're, they're, you know, press boxes around the country. There just aren't that many people there anymore. And so I think there's maybe a feeling of, geez, if we insult these guys, they aren't, we aren't going to get anything from them. Um, yes. And so I, I, 
it seems like maybe it's easier for people who aren't, you know, part of the racing media of the press to go and chase these stories and, and kind of, you know, uncover what needs to be uncovered. I And I totally agree that stuff that should be uncovered needs to be uncovered and, and somebody should be doing it. But I kind of get that the racing media is maybe a little reluctant. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's right, that, that if they – go in and, and kind of justifiably dig, they may get some pushback. Um, but I think that's maybe the way it is. And so it's just perhaps easier for uh, those outside of that to, to go in and kind of dig up a little bit and uncover some things. Because again, I totally agree. The stuff, there is stuff that deserves to be exposed. And that is, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say, Hey, let's, you know, put a, put a cover on some of these stories, but it's just who does it and how best it gets done is maybe the question mark. Yeah. I mean, it's such an insular world and there are so many people in racing that have a lot of power that are kind of doing some shady stuff and they, you know, they have, they have a lot of friends in high places and they can bite back at people and be vindictive and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying that it might be, it might be better suited for the role that the mainstream media has. And the part of so much for the time. Part of the problem there is to say the mainstream media is kind of abandoned racing. And so then you're left in this yes. void of well, how do you get the mainstream media to look at some of these stories and, and look at some of these stories and then balance it all out. You know, you, it, then it's a little bit of, well, we're bringing these guys in to uncover this bad story, but the rest of the year they don't cover the good stuff anymore. So that's a little bit of a, it's a, yeah, it's a conundrum, I guess. Is, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Definitely. Well, it's great to hear your insight and you, you're such a good handicapper and a good guy. And, you know, I've, I've admired you for a long time. It was great to get to, to get to know you a little bit more. Tell the people where they can catch you on Capital OTB. Uh, Capital OTB TV, the, as I say, during Saratoga, again, next year, we'll be live from the backstretch every morning from 9 to 11, 9 to 10 handicapping, 10 to 11 with uh, interviews. Um, the rest of the year, we go from a little studio down in our uh OTB race book down on Central Avenue in Albany. We have a little TV studio there. I'm back in to start things up uh, on Friday afternoon, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I come in in the afternoon and kind of handicap two or three of the tracks we're showing, just kind of jump in and give some ideas during the afternoon. Saturdays, uh, there's a handicapping show at nine, interviews at 10, and Sundays at 10 o'clock, we do some interviews and some recaps uh, and whatnot. And again, you can watch it up here upstate on cable uh but you can also catch us live the morning shows capital o tv youtube channel or uh, as i say the uh roberts channel we're a sub rtm or a sub channel now you can pick that up on roku or the fire stick definitely worth watching and check out equidaily 2.0 coming soon from seth marrow seth really appreciate the time man thanks for talking to me uh, it was fun thanks joe appreciate it All right, so last week on Better Things and our Breeders' Cup handicapping segment, unfortunately, we came up empty, minus $288, although we definitely got unlucky with Warlike Goddess coming up just short in the Flower Bowl. That she was clearly best and got victimized by a real laughably slow pace, but that happens sometimes, and even so, the rest of the pick five chalked out, so I probably would have only broken even on that ticket anyway. Olympia bounced back in a big way in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. You have to say the horses behind him were pretty disappointing. And considering the way he ran Saturday, I probably saved money in the Whitney when American Revolution scratched. Overall, I stand at two, plus $270.45. So we're still in the black. With a couple more of these episodes to go. And we turn to this Saturday and the Better's Paradise of Kentucky Downs, which will host two winning your in challenge races for the Breeders' Cup. First, in the day's ninth race, a full field of 12 older males will go six furlongs in the Grade 2 FanDuel Turf Sprint, a fees-paid qualifier for the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. And then the 10th, another full field of older males will go a mile and a half in the Grade 2 Kentucky Cup Turf Stakes, Kentucky Turf Cup Stakes, a qualifier for the $4 million Longines Breeders' Cup Turf. The two races can be seen on CNBC from 5 to 6 o'clock Eastern Time. This is where it's at. You know, I talked about Kentucky Downs last week during my interview with C.J. Johnson, but it's some of, if not the best value for an American horse player on the entire calendar. Full fields, low takeout, turf racing. It's a very difficult meet to handicap, but it's also the kind of meet where you only need to be right once or twice to make it worthwhile. Start with the turf sprint, which is interesting 
because Kentucky Downs doesn't run a lot of six furlong races due to the track's configuration and how long the turn and the stretch are. So the six furlong gate is basically at the top of the far turn, which gives a you know a distinct disadvantage to horses in the outside posts. And the heavy favorite in here, Arrest Me Red, just happened to draw the 12 hole. The issue is there's not that much speed to his inside, so he should be able to clear or at least get to the tooth path in short order. But overall, it's a great betting race where even if Arrest Me Red wins, you can still get paid with some prices underneath. The two long shots I'm most interested in are number four, Charcoal, and number nine, Front Run the Fed. Charcoal's an improving horse who's coming off of two sneaky big races that are better than they look on paper. Two back, he dueled on a fast pace and won the battle but lost the war, finished a close second. Then last time, he got bottled up in traffic for much of the stretch before just getting clear late and again running a narrow second. The thing I like about him is he's got enough speed to lay close to what should be a pretty moderate pace. He's going to be at least 15 to 1. Front Red the Fed is easily fast enough to win this, so he probably won't be his 15 to 1 morning line, but he's dropping out of a grade one in the third start of his form cycle. So I'm happy with either eight or 10 to 1 on him. And number six, Bob's Edge isn't impossible either. He's 30 to 1 morning line. He's got a big late kick. He's got a win on turf, and he's got dirt figures that make him competitive. He would benefit if number 13, Artemis City Limits, drew into the race. He would add significant or significantly more early speed to set up Bob's Edge's late kick. So let's put let's, the play in the FanDuel turf sprint. We're going to do $30 to win each on number four and number nine, $10 to win on number six, 50 cent trifecta box, four, five, six, nine, 12, which costs $30, a $10 exact and number 12, arrest me red over the four and the nine. So that's $120 total. In the turf cup, Number eight, Gafo is clearly the horse to beat. He's running back in just two weeks. We don't even see, we never see this in racing. He's wheeling back just 14 days after winning the grade one sword dancer at Saratoga. You love to see it. Number three, Temple, and number four, Arklo, look like his main two challengers, but neither is going to be a particularly enticing price. So I'm going to throw in two long shots. First is number one, Red Knight, who was second to Arklo in this race in 2020. His form wasn't great last year, and he's eight years old now, so who knows if he can still really run, but he was transferred to Mike Maker over the winter, and Mike Maker just cannot do any wrong at these Kentucky Downs meets, and Red Knight won his first race for the barn off the layoff, and number two, Breakpoint is interesting as well. He, he went wire to wire going further than this, going a mile and three quarters, I think to my knowledge, the only mile and three quarters race in America, the San Juan Capistrano Stakes at Santa Anita. He went wire to wire despite setting pretty honest fractions. The half in there was 47 and four. So that was a pretty impressive effort, even though we only got a 91 buyer. So I'll try to get those two to win or at least get in the number. I'll also throw in number 12 highest honors underneath for Chad Brown. So the play here in the Turf Cup Stakes is a $1 trifecta, 128 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 12 with one, two, three, four, eight, twelve. So that's sixty dollars. Five dollar tri trifecta, eight gafo with three, four, twelve, with one, two, in case the one and the two run third and it chalks out on top for a cost of thirty dollars. And then a ten dollar exacta, eight gafo with one, two for a cost of twenty dollars. That's a total of one hundred ten dollars. The total amount invested over the two races is two hundred thirty dollars. We'll put all those plays up on the screen. Tune in from 5 to 6 Eastern on CNBC as we hopefully make some money and build that bankroll while seeing two tickets punched to the Breeders' Cup, which is, which is now less than two months away on November 4th and November 5th at Keeneland. Good luck if you're following along. Okay, so that's going to do it for this episode of Better Things with Joe Bianca. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to my guest, Seth Merrow, for coming on. Love talking to him. Go check him out at Equidaily on Twitter at Seth Merrow 2 and on the Capital OTB broadcast. He does a great job. I also want to thank our producer, Patty Wolf, the Breeders' Cup, for their sponsorship. And our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Leah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. Follow along and watch the Breeders' Cup winning your in challenge races from Kentucky Downs 5 to 6 Eastern this Saturday at CNBC, on CNBC. We'll see you next time on Better Things with Joe Bianca.